Well, holy smokers, folks, we are about to get into an eight piece here today. Yes, an eight piece, the first one in the history of this channel. Eight different videos for me to react to in this one, all right? All right, first one up here is NVIDIA is the best of the best. I wanna to listen to what this analyst has to say about NVIDIA stock. Then we're getting to this one, Greg Branch, who I would say has been uh, very bearish on the market. Uh, let's hear what he has to say. The market rally is gonna to continue to run. Are we flipping even the most bearish people over the bullish side? This is getting interesting. Speaking about bearish folks, what about Mr. Shorthills Capital, Steve Weiss? Where is he at in regards to this market? We're gonna to react to that one. Then we're gonna to react to this one, uh, Stephanie Link sells Nike. Want to hear her reasoning behind them? Um, I view Nike as a huge buy-the-dip opportunity for this next 6 to 12 months. Uh, other people are selling it right now, so I would love to hear her perspective on that, right? Then we're going to go ahead and react to this one. Biggest bull on Wall Street suggests his 2024 price target may not be high enough. <laughs> okay, okay. Amazon is positioned really well for 2024. I want to hear what that analyst has to say. And then I want to react to this analyst here, Amazon. I uh, hear why Moffitt Davidson analyst favors the stock. And uh, Amazon is the third biggest position in the public account. So I think it's an important one to kind of hear what these folks are saying. And then last one up here, Ed Yarndini is going to speak about the economy, kind of how he's feeling about the market. So eight little clips for me to react to in this one it's a beast of a video but folks i appreciate you joining me thank you for being subscribed thank you for being here also if you haven't got to take advantage of my uh, 45 minute video the free one check out the pinned comment down there it goes into exactly how i plan to invest in 2024 you should get some good value out of that one i can email that over tonight or tomorrow all right guys let's get into this nvidia joining me with where he's finding opportunities now is veteran tech investor paul meeks currently a finance professor at the citadel uh, my middle school friends are laughing, Paul, because I called it the citadel uh, when I first moved south. So anyway, <laughs> glad to be able to redeem myself. Welcome. Great to see you. So Thanks is, for having me. What, what would your thoughts be about Apple as a, as a stock right now? Yeah, I don't think Apple is a uh, viable security present. You know, right now it's trading for about <laughs> wait, wait, five or six times what Wall Street is expecting for its long-term or secular growth rate. And yes, it's a great company. Does it deserve to be a $3 trillion market cap going to $4 trillion? I think uh, going forward, it's going to be tougher and tougher to achieve those gains. We know the company has shrank uh, revenues every quarter for the past four, might even uh, unfortunately do the same thing this quarter. And so I don't see the upside, particularly after the stock has done so well in recent memory. So among the magnificent sure. seven, among the mega cap tech stocks, it's not on my list. Very interesting. As its market cap sits right on $3 trillion today. You do like a couple of the other ones, though. Alphabet, for instance, Amazon, Microsoft. I see a lot of them up here. Meta as well. Ooh. Yeah, so I like, like among the um, uh, Magnificent Seven. My favorite idea is NVIDIA. And I know it sounds a bit cavalier to say and not particularly creative, but here's a company, again, we talk about the PEG ratio, PE to growth, like I just mentioned for Apple. Uh, next year, the company should probably grow its revenue and earnings per share at about 70%. And its PE ratio is not even 30 times. It's actually not that much higher. No, no, it's it, technically the forward PE is lower than Apple's forward PE. Let that sink in for a moment, okay? And Apple, we don't even know if their stock's going to get growth. Even if it does, it's going to be a small amount, right? NVIDIA was almost a guarantee that it gets massive growth. So, whew, that's The S&P 500, that'll be lucky to grow its EPS next year at 5 to 10%. So NVIDIA is my best of the best. But because I don't see a recession in this country, and I do think that digital advertising will remain robust, I do like Alphabet, and I do like Meta, and as my number two after number one NVIDIA AI plays, I do like Microsoft. It's come a long way, but it does have a little bit of uh, more upside, in I my see, opinion. I see Microsoft, or I'm sorry, Micron on this list as well. I did get a question from a viewer, Paul, about Intel, which has about doubled this year, if I'm not mistaken. Wondering if that's a name you could bet on for next year. I don't know if you're, you know, consider yourself a chip analyst yeah. per se, but what would you say about Intel's prospects? Oh, I know the company very well. I think under uh, Pat Gelsinger, the company is better managed. It remains to be seen if their entree into outsourced manufacturing is as wonderful as the bulls claim it's going to be. I do think that they will have a little bit of bounce back in the PC business next year, which still drives Intel because PCs should have 
a unit ramp next year after having a couple miserable years. But right now, that stock is very expensive based on what I see is its long term growth, both top and bottom line of probably five to 10 percent best. Fair. All so right. I would not buy it now. If I held it, maybe I'd hold it a bit longer. But I think that stock is expensive. That's fair. That's fair. No no disagreements there. Next one up here. The market rally will continue to run. And this is coming from a gentleman that is, uh, let's just call it, seemed much more on the bearish side over the year. It. He expects a 20% correction in Q1 and says a Fed hike is more likely than a Fed cut to start so the year. he's still Correct. bearish. Okay. I think that's what we're getting right off the bat. 20% correction in Q1. I'm expecting a correction at some point in Q1 as well. But how big of a correction am I expecting? I'm expecting more in that, I would say, 5 to 10% type uh, correction in Q1. If we get 20%, I would actually be really happy with that because I would love to buy the dip on that baby. But my expectation is more in that 5 to 10% range in terms of a correction at some point in Q1. And just a CNBC contributor and founder and managing partner at Veritas Financial. Greg, listen, I give you credit. You're sticking with it. You're not, you're not throwing in the towel. Why not? What gives you such conviction as the, the stocks just continue to rip higher? Well, Kelly, I have to see the underlying data change. And so while certainly the Fed's posture changed, um, which was a surprise not only to me, but I think the vast majority of bulls will say that that posture change was a surprise as well. The underlying data really hasn't. And so, yes, back in October or, or back in late September, what kicked off this rally is that we saw core growth of CPI go down to 20 basis points. And we saw the jobs number go down to 150,000. And what some of us warned at the time was that you couldn't extrapolate a new paradigm for that. And that's exactly what happened. We saw core bounce back to the bandwidth that it's been in for the last 16 months of 30 basis points. We saw jobs number bounce back to 199,000. We saw unemployment retrench to 3.7%. And so when you look at these key numbers, we've been in a holding pattern for the vast majority of 14 months. And so while the year over year number continues to decline the month over month number hasn't seen much disinflation at all and as we Even, get to those I mean, look we just got some negative ppi readings right and remember it, it's not it's not goods that we're worried about right it, it's the services that we're worried about and so that gets us to the other number which is the unemployment number we still have historically low claims and so i don't see anything that is moving us from 3.7 to what the fed indicated what they need for a 2% baseline inflation, which is about 4.4%, particularly if they're going to ease in posture, if not policy. And while those numbers remain the same and the base effect becomes less favorable, what we're going to start to see is that year over year number is going to start to appear as though inflation is retrenching and it very well may be. Hmm. And so until some of that underlying data changes, I just can't change the outlook that it's more likely that they raise minimally but that they raise before they cut. Greg, that, that, it also doesn't mean that people should just not invest or not be in the market because they're scared of what could be or what could happen or anything else. Is there any way that investors put a shopping list together for what to buy or what to sell based upon this kind of an outlook? It, it has to stand a reason that people still have to be invested in this kind of market. Yeah, Dom, I, I have my own shopping list, in fact. And so you're exactly right. And, and what I've what I failed to mention is I don't see a specific catalyst necessarily in the first month or two of the year. So, so I do believe that this rally will continue to run, even if ever so slowly, uh, until the, the items that I've mentioned become more apparent. Uh, and while we are running, I think the, the key thing to do is look at three areas. The first is those with very strong secular tailwinds, even though they may seem a bit expensive. Uh, we see generational tailwinds in AI. We see generational tailwinds in cloud and the names that are clear, the Amazons, uh, Microsoft's, uh, Google's of the world. The second category are things that, ha that participate in those same strong tailwinds, but haven't participated to the degree that that first category is. And cybersecurity is a great name there. Uh, Palo Alto, Zscaler, CrowdStrike, they are s essential to whatever is going to be the future of AI and, and cloud, essential to both of those ecosystems. You know, you see a lot of these companies. So this is, this is really intriguing. So this gentleman is basically bullish on many of the most loved Wall Street stocks, right? Because uh, many of these stocks he's talking about prior to this and right now, these are many of Wall Street's favorite uh, stocks that they love. So this is interesting because he's bullish on those. But on the flip side, 
He also is in this reality of uh, that he believes the Fed's going to still raise rates before lowering rates. Like, I, I was shocked when I heard that. I was like, <laughs> okay, that's an interesting uh, thought, maybe, but I don't know about that. Percent, But that's probably not the magnitude that we'll see them uh, at a year from now or two years from now. And then the last is the, those categories of things that have to catch up that have not participated, even though we saw a lot of that catch up happen in December. So financials, for example, is a sector trading at a forward multiple of 14.5 times less than the S&P had a so so year a barely up to double digits. But if you believe, as I do, that yields will return to levels that we saw a month or two ago, then an interest margin environment becomes more favorable. We see the M&A environment becoming more favorable. If you don't believe, like I do, right. that the yields will return and then we'll get cuts, check out the income generator, something like utilities, which also has a participant. Interesting. Well, it was, it was interesting. I mean, it's a, whew, that was that was intriguing. Okay. All right, next one up here, Mr. Short Hills Capital, Steve Weish. The prime time for AI isn't happening yet. Is he going bullish now? To grow as fast as Microsoft, they say, with earnings forecast to be up 15%. That's three times as quickly as Apple's 5% growth. The stock trades for just 20 times, a discount, they say, to both Microsoft and Apple's 30 times, and it's gained 50% this year, but the multiple hasn't. Correct. And the cloud business has been defined as being disappointing, witnessing growth of 22%. That cloud business is going to accelerate in 2024. I think it's a very important exercise to think about the MAG-7 and tactically understand where you're actually going to see the outperformance in the upcoming year. I agree with this call when you look at Alphabet relative, certainly to Apple. And by the way, Apple has been the underperformer of the MAG-7 yeah, so I mean, far year to date. Year it's up 48%, I, I percent. all right, it's up 48%, but mm -hmm. it's the underperformer of the MAG-7. If I look at the 2024, I see Apple underperforming once again, but I like the position that I agree Alphabet with that. is in. As long as you tell me, again, I go back to what I said I before, the economy holds in, we don't see the deceleration because if we see the deceleration, I have to worry about ad spending at that point. Otherwise, ad spending is going to be strong in a year where you have a presidential election and the Olympics. I like what they did in the Good acknowledgement, point. at least, of artificial intelligence not being where they wanted it to be relative to Microsoft. And I By the way, do you want to know a $3 little stock that's going to benefit huge from the Olympics uh, this, this coming year? in 2024 and benefit from the presidential election. It's a little $3 stock out there. They're going to benefit massively from this. And the company's name is Fubo, Fubo TV. They will benefit massively. Um, that is the sports streaming platform that, you know, if you want, or if you're into sports, like you sign up for Fubo. And so the Olympics just being there is going to be very good. Advertising dollars are obviously massive because, you know, obviously uh, viewership's insane for the Olympics, right? I mean, on top of that, you got, you know, elections coming, presidential election, big money being spent, right? And, um, you know, a lot of that money's going to go to obviously the Metas and the Googles of the world, but a lot of that money's also going to go to somebody like a Fubo that, you know, people are watching their TVs and you need to advertise to very specific people that live in very specific zip codes, um, very specific neighborhoods and whatnot, right? And so that's going to be um, ultimately... Uh, let's just call it a big benefit for many companies, and Fubo is just one of those little secret companies about Alphabet that. Alphabet has the clear potential to be a leader in the MAG-7. Nonetheless, Fubo's advertising revenue should beast in 2024. If it doesn't go up substantially in 2024, I'll be extremely disappointed. It should skyrocket in 2024. Lastly, the last several years, they've been buying back stock. They're actually implementing the Apple and Microsoft strategy. If they continue to do that, I think this is an obvious name that you want to continue to own as a core holding. Weiss, you own it as well. And Barron's is not naive to the fact that, you know, they suggest the company was caught off guard by Microsoft related to AI, but that it quickly regrouped. Mm -hmm. And if they, if there wasn't a perception that they were still going to be a player and a major one, the stock wouldn't have done what, what it has for, for this year too, which is no slouch either. It's right up there with Microsoft. Yeah. On a day, by the way, where there's reports and we're talking about OpenAI having a valuation of $100 billion. Yeah. Um, look, very few companies have a product that becomes a habit, that are habit-forming. You know, we had cigarettes and that wasn't good for you, but we've got Google. 
and that's habit forming. Where else do you go? You go to Chrome, you go to Google. They've got a massive installed base when you take a look at their operating system. Yeah, but the whole point, right. though, of this the skepticism right. is that, but, but, yes, where do you go? Right. You always did go. The question is, are you going to continue to go? But here's my point. <laughs> For all the hoopla about AI that we've seen, it's not really prime time ready. So Microsoft came out earlier. Chat that is. It was, well, chat is, but not really. If you take a look at chat, I mean, it's usable, but it's not where it should be, where you're going to rely on it all the time. Right that's now, I'd say point. it's more that's than true. intellectual curiosity. So yeah, my that, point is, true. when you have a habit from a company that's a habit, that is not a startup where they can be put out of business by Microsoft. What it does do, it gives them a lot of runway to catch up, and they can catch it up. And by the way, Meta is not the only company that got more efficient over the last year. So did I- yeah, Chad GPT, uh, to be fair about this, folks, I think this is important. I talk about this. It is very possible that that's not even very relevant in five or ten years from now. You might say, how is that even possible? They're talking about $100 billion valuation now, blah, blah, blah. Here's the deal, Okay. I grew up uh, in the age of the computer coming to life, which was really the 1990s in terms of the internet age and like the masses starting to adopt computers, right? And I remember in school as kind of like a middle school, even high schooler, I remember when I would go to search something, I would use uh, Yahoo search and also use a service back in those days called Ask Jeeves. That's what it was called. And maybe some of you guys know, uh, you know, Yahoo Search and then Ask Jeeves. But those were like the popular ones back when I was a kid, right? Um, it's called middle school, high school. And then what did I start using by the time I got to college and beyond it was Google Search. And I was like, holy smokes, Google Search is far you know, better than these other products. And I just, you know, from college on, it was always Google Search, Google Search. And obviously, we know, uh, you know, the business that Google's become. So, you know, you may be experimenting with ChatGPT today and over the next few years, but it's very possible. And it's not a for sure thing, but it's very possible, like, that's not even a relevant service in five or ten years from now. So it's just, just something to kind of keep in mind. I saw this happen with Search. There might be a far exceeding product that's far better than ChatGPT, right? Um, maybe there's not, or maybe there's going to be like, it's just something that's a little food for thought in regards to that, right? Because, you know, Yahoo used to have huge market share in the search market and Ask Jeeves used to be huge. And, and now, uh, almost no one searches with those platforms. It's all Google search. That very efficient. They got rid of a lot of vanity projects. Google search got so dominant that now the government's trying to come after them. I mean, you know, for monopolistic powers like it's crazy right side where they're spending their capital they are buying back stock so that's why i own it to me you've got regulatory issues but those same regulatory issues are facing microsoft they're facing apple they're facing meta so you just These guys don't care about any of that they're like yeah well the, the regulatory issues may be there but alphabet might be worth more broken up anyway exactly exactly and that's always that remains to be seen but that's going to keep the bid under the stock and why when they lost that lawsuit for last week or the week before about the app store for gaming, the stock didn't budge. I was kind of surprised at that. I thought there'd be a short-term opportunity to buy more, but I never got it. Yeah, Jim Labenthal, you own this too. It's the time of year you're in though, Steve Weiss, and all due respect. I mean, we're in that very bullish time of year. Um, no one's looking at anything bad news right now. Uh, people will start looking at bad news again in Q1, but right now everybody's just focused on up, 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 up until end of the year. It's actually my biggest tech holding, Scott. Um, and, you know, apropos of our earlier discussion, I think this is a stock you can buy right now. Um, that's my opinion based on also an opinion that the market has held this stock back still on the belief that Microsoft is going to eat uh, Alphabet's lunch. I think that's kind of Brad Gerstner's position. I, I think that's a mistake for the reasons that uh, Steve was just laying out there. And, you know, as Joe was pointing out, unless things really fall off the cliff, the advertising business is going to be good. The web services are going to be good. This, this video is not synced to his audio at all. Maybe 70% that of Microsoft. I think that's a bargain. I don't think it should be at a discount to Microsoft. Bryn, you don't like it. Why? Well, well I mean, not that I don't like it. We all use it, but... I think Joe did a wonderful it. job. Right. right. You own a lot of these. Her. You own a lot of tech, but you don't own mm -hmm. this one. Yeah, exactly. And so I think Joe did a great job on the on the thesis. So my question is, well, why is it still at a 20 multiple? And when I look at it and take a step back, the two big things is 90% of the revenues are ads. 9% of the revenues 
are Google Cloud, and it's barely profitable, but it's 25% of the employees. And Steve, I agree, they cut back on a few things, maybe like massages every week. <laughs> but to me, when I look at these companies that are executing, when I look at NVIDIA, when I look at even Apple, when I look at Microsoft, Meta, Apple? you know what you have? You have visionaries. And Saya is not a founder, right? Saya was the third, third... Wait a minute. In all due respect, ma'am, the visionaries are gone from Apple nowadays, okay? When Steve Jobs passed away, that was one of the visionaries. And the second visionary was Johnny Ive. And Johnny Ive left Apple, what was that? Uh, three years ago, five years ago, something like that? So let's be very clear. Apple no longer has a visionary at that company. So uh, let's slow, let's slow down on all that. That's everything Apple's got, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive. One in, you know, past Bill Gates. You have a visionaries that are executing. And to me, okay, I don't own the stock, but I followed or read the report. It seems like they just don't have that come together where we are going to do one thing or two things very well. And it seems that to me, the whole thing about open AI, I mean, they bought DeepMind forever ago. And so to say that they were flat footed makes no sense. To me, they're trying to be like a fast follower now and trying to catch up because I don't think they have that leadership from the top that allows them to actually have strong multiple expansion. And I think that leadership is one of the reasons it still has a 20 PE. Yeah, let me speak about Google stock for a moment here and just kind of give my opinion. So my opinion on Google stock is I, I think it's always an ownable stock, right? Uh, but just because ownable stock doesn't mean you have to own it, right? Kind of like an Apple, right? Apple's technically always an ownable stock. Doesn't mean you have to own it. Doesn't mean uh, it's necessarily a great buy. And that's kind of the way I view Google. You know, uh, obviously YouTube's a giant. You're watching this on YouTube right now. We know that, right? We know Google search is a giant. We know those platforms are going to continue to be relevant for at least the next few years. Ten years out is hard to see. But for the next few years, you know, everything's fine there. And so always great balance sheet at Google, fair valuation. It's always an ownable stock, right? Um, but once again, just because it's ownable, it doesn't mean you have to own it. All right, next one up here, Nike. I don't think it was terrible. It was exactly as I expected. We were talking yesterday, actually, about flat revenue growth. We got flat revenue growth. But... We also got better profitability, which is the thing that kind of kept me in the name. Yeah. I mean, it was much, gross margins were much better than expected. It looked though no good. But no, the outlook was not very good. And so it's like an opportunity cost is really what I, the way I'm thinking about it. I think that they will eventually get to low single, low double digit, upper single digit revenues eventually, Scott. But I don't know the timing. I think it's actually been pushed out as a result. They have a product cycle that's happening next year, but that's going to take a long time to get into the the system. So for me, I think there are just better other ideas elsewhere within retail, but also within the broader market. You think this is um, dead money? I do. I do. At least for the next six months. I really do. And so I would rather take that money. By the way, I'm up on the position a lot. The stock is still up 20. So uh, could Nike be dead money for the next six months? Absolutely. It could be. I hope it is. Um, as somebody that would love to aggressively add this stock over the next six months, but the way I invest is probably a little bit different than maybe some of these Wall Streeters, where a lot of these Wall Streeters will kind of just, you know, dump completely in a stock and out of stock all in a day and things like that. And that's part of the reason you get such crazy volatile moves is when these folks go to sell, many times they're selling millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, or even billions of dollars of the stock all very rapidly, right? And that's why you get these 10, 15, 20% moves in these stocks. Whereas I like to kind of slowly move out of a position or slowly move into a position most of the time. For me to do a huge lump sum um, sell or buy is pretty rare. It, it happens every once in a while, but it's pretty darn rare, right? And so I like to build a position over a six, 12 month span. And so I look at a Nike and I say, I hope it's dead money over the next six months as I would love to add that position each and every week for many, many months. Percent from the lows seen a month and a half ago. So I'm, I'm taking some of the profits and I'm going to deploy them into other things. I just think right now I don't necessarily need to buy something with the market, you know, kind of on a tear. This says that the 15% run since November 1st yep. was bogus. That it, it was built on... No. I don't think both. Nothing. No, 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 no. That's too, that's way too, too, well, too tough. Well, it's giving back 11% now. But it's also up from the lows. It was up 37% from the lows, recent lows a couple of months ago. I know, but so, January 1st to October 31st, the stock was down like 12%. Yeah. Everything that we've seen of late for this name has happened since November 1st till today okay. or till yesterday before the sell-off happened after earnings. Right, and I think that the excitement was from the analyst community. We talked about it. Four upgrades, all kinds of reiterating buys, upping targets, and all that sort of thing. So the setup was terrible going into the quarter. 
but I think the, the excitement was on the margin side. The inventories are falling, freight costs are falling, that's really, DTC is rising in terms of a percentage of, of total revenue. All that's really good. So their gross margins expanded 170 sure. basis points. That is huge. The whisper was 160. They gave guidance last quarter of 100. So they really blasted right, right uh, out, out there. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, I think that it was just a lot of people got excited on the top line expectation, and I, I just never had that. I think eventually you're going to get that, but I, you just didn't get it this quarter. So right. it was ahead of itself. Stock was ahead of itself. It's That's not it. like it's, it's not like the street fair. today is is overwhelmingly negative. You got one downgrade. Okay, TD says they're taking it to market perform from outperform. They cut the. Top. There's been more that have uh, kind of. Uh, jumped on to the negativity bandwagon though over the past few days. It's just analyst community, Wall Street in general moves super slow this time of year and because it's the holiday season. Uh, you know, some people aren't even working, paying attention to stuff. So, I mean, to be honest, it's a uh, it's a slow moving kind of downgrade cycle that stocks go through right now. One hundred four from one hundred twenty nine. Jan Rogers Niffen, who was on with us this morning on Squawk on the Street, wasn't too concerned either. Said they're going to get it right. Um, they're on their way to doing so. I'll come to you in a second because I got to go to you first, Pharma Jim. You sold the stock not that long ago, correct? Last week. Last week. That was a good call. Um, yeah, I mean, some of it had to do with the luck of my timing of getting in right after the last quarter, which Jimmy was... festive. That's what I'm calling you for the rest yeah, of the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's see if we can stay this way through the whole show. I'm I don't know. missing a Santa hat. Okay, all right. But, uh, well, <laughs> Santa didn't come to Nike shareholders, we'll say that. No, he did not. Um, look, this, this is a turnaround story. I mean, apropos of what you were saying about the first half of this year, actually most of the year that the stock was down, people were looking for a turnaround. The last quarterly report gave a very good sign that the turnaround was in place. But with the guidance and the verbiage, the commentary that we got last night, I, I think there's considerable question. First off, no signs of help from China. That's an important part of the equation. Before it goes further here, I got to address this, okay? Do I view Nike as a turnaround company, a turnaround play like he talks about there? And the answer to that is absolutely not. No, okay? As somebody that's owned plenty of turnaround plays over the past 15 years, I can tell you Nike is not a turnaround play. Nike is just a phenomenal company that's just growth is weak right now, right? Um, as it has been for almost all retailers for this past 12 plus months, right? With consumer confidence being hit so bad, with inflation hitting consumers so bad, and with obviously, you know, a lot of people just not having the funds to, let's say, go buy a new pair of Nikes or anything for that matter. I mean, look at almost all these companies that, uh, you know, are more well-established, either retailers or brands. I mean, they've had trouble putting up any sort of uh, impressive numbers as far as their, their top line, right? That's all going to pass. And so Nike is not a turnaround company, I can tell you that much. That's just, that's preposterous. But what you really didn't want to see is softening of demand in North America. Full Locker is an example of a turnaround company, right? Revenues going big time negative, uh, profitability eroded in a massive way. That's a turnaround company. That's a whole different ball game than a Nike. This is not a turnaround company. Um, and you, you did see that. It you was in stuff. line. It was in line. It was down 4%, no, but, but that the, was what expectations were. The verbiage were. is that, that they're seeing softening. Into, you're out of the stock. Why are you defending that? Because I, didn't think, I don't really think the quarter was what was the problem. Continue, the continue, commentary of the quarter, <laughs> Stephanie's right, though. The, the quarter was actually okay. The, it's the guidance it's going the forward. It's the guidance going forward. What they talked about softening sort of globally in North demand. America. Right. You can't no, have that. They talked globally about sort of consumers softening. Yeah, which includes North America. You can't have that. At this point in a turnaround, you can't have it. Now, I don't think Nike is fatally flawed. That's not what I'm saying. Where I agree with you is for the next six months, it's probably dead money right. because when a stock turns around, not from a fatal mishap here, but from a cyclical down turn when a stock turns around you need two quarters in a row of good performance you don't have it it's reset after right. this and, quarter and the valuation so this is like in con contrast to target which is also a turnaround story but it's trading at 15 times forward estimates with margin upside this is trading at 30 33 times forward estimates it's right up against its app it's not forward if you look at well you should really Nike's fiscal year ends at a weird time it ends in May if I recall right so you really need to be looking at the May 2025 numbers right and you're, based upon what analysts have them at, I think you're at a, like a 25 times the May 2025 numbers. I think analysts are way off. I mean, the fact that Nike's now announced this up to $2 billion in cost savings, like, you know how much of that's going to hit the bottom line? Oh, my gosh. Um, then if you add on a consumer that's in a better spot over this next 12 months and what they could do for the revenue line item for Nike over the next year or so, I think... Uh, 
the company's going to emerge way more profitable than anybody in the analyst community expects, even the most bullish analysts. I think that's going to happen. There's just no room for error. Joe, you sold it November 1st. Yeah, we sold it November 1st. You own Lulu. Out of the JOT ETF. Um, if you walk back and see the reason why it was initially placed in the ETF, it was because of momentum. It wasn't, in fact, the quality metrics that we observe. The reason that we sold it was the deceleration in the revenue growth. It was there was clearly that Nike was losing a little bit of that qualitative nature. Um, there are stocks that have a stronger degree of sensitivity, if you would, to the macro. And Ni Nike clearly is one of those stocks. Fair. You know, Fair. if you think about everything Fair. that you heard yesterday, what you continued to hear was promotion, promotion, promotion. Heavy promotion. Why? Because they're up against a challenged macro environment, very similar to what FedEx said the day prior. And I think to Stephanie's point, I don't see the improvement of that over the next six months. But you're not seeing a lot of discounting across the board in retail. I'll just go back to the conversation I had with Niffin this morning, who knows yeah. the landscape better than anybody, said you're not seeing a level of bloated inventory right. and incredible discounting like you, you might have in the past. So maybe this is in some part a singularly Nike story. That well, Nike it, it needs to get its you-know-what together. And it's not a read through to any level on any other retail. But does does any other a retailer have the, the magnitude of the exposure globally that Nike does? Exactly. I, I mean, I would make exactly. the argument Nike is, is so exactly. heavily exposed geographically like no other retailer that we could really mention. So 100%. I, I don't know if that's fair. I think Nike's doing the right things. I think Stephanie's right. The margins were OK. They're embarking upon a $2 billion uh, cost-saving initiative. It sounds Sounds like they're doing the right things. It just sounds to me like they're acknowledging that it's China, it's Europe, it's the Middle East, it's weak. Yep, hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, next one up here. The biggest bull on Wall Street suggests his 2024 price target may not be high enough. Holy smoke, is this a no joke? Is dollar and the rate side specifically will bring in Wall Street's biggest bull for now. Based on the latest CNBC market strategist survey, John Stolfus is the chief investment strategist at Oppenheimer Asset Management. Uh, it is for right now the most bullish target on Wall Street. Give us the number and take us through the fundamental reason why. Well, it's only 5,200 from where we are right now. I put it in, uh, uh, what was it? I, I, it was at the bottom. It was around. In October, uh, you, you yeah, downgraded October. and then. Because yeah. we had gone, we came in this year with a 4,400 target. At the end of uh, July, we raised it to 4,900, and then we ran into that three-month downdraft. We thought the bears were really serious about this. They were going to imitate a 2018. We didn't take it as a fundamental change. We just thought the negative pitch book was out on the desk, and that's what they were rolling with. And so we reduced it to 4,400 again. Now I'm sitting here going, well, you know, we're only, uh, we missed uh, that 49 would have been nice to have because it's probably an opportunity to see it. I'm not changing my target. I'm sticking with 44 with 5,200 for next year. That's only about 8, 9% up from where we are right now. The economy, as you all said, is, is doing remarkably well. The Fed has been remarkable. Once it got away from being behind the curve, the Fed caught up, the Fed moved ahead, it cut inflation by about half, and in fact, some of the latest numbers, the big figure, they were under three on a couple of the key indexes that they, index numbers that they look at. So when you look at it, the consumer is in remarkably good shape based on other cycles. You know, I've been doing this, I've been in this business since 1983, so I've been, I came in when Paul Volcker was in his second term. So this is, the, the Ben Bernanke legacy Fed is amazing in that it is highly sensitive as to how it applies its mandate of a good economy and full employment, somewhere between three and four percent unemployment. Uh, and it has been very sensitive. The only time it got really intense was that 475 bips hike last year. And since then, if you look at the whole cycle, it's been about 11, 11 hikes and four pauses or, or skips as they call it. So we can't help but think that 5,200 makes sense. We're looking for earnings around 240, about 9% up from where this year is likely to come in at around 230. 
our expectations are that it'll still be our call has remained cyclicals over defensives. We think technology is in good shape in the sense that it is not showing signs of being at a plateau. So even when it becomes richly valued, the next thing you know, you got another development on hand that offers prospects for higher earnings. I mean, the, the rates. Wait, first off, do I think he's too low with his 5,200 call? Uh, the answer to that is no, I don't, because you know you might say, "Well, it's only you know a few percent from here." Usually, you get seven to nineteen percent return after you've had uh, you know a, a horrible year, ten percent plus down, down draw, uh, then a ten percent plus up move. The next year is usually seven to nineteen percent up. So I don't think he's too low. I once again, I think there's probably going to be a nice size pullback in Q1. Um, if there's not, there's going to be a, a nice size pullback at some point. Every year you get a nice size pullback, right, where the market draws down five, ten percent, and then you kind of go on your next bull run. And so you know, it's even Tom Lee's talking about S and P goes to forty three hundred in the first half of the year, right? That's a big down draw. And then you got to climb back up to fifty two hundred, I believe, where's Tom Lee's at? Um, I believe he's right there with this gentleman. So. Hmm. You know, that's. Uh, I think that's very. I think that's very realistic. I guess it matters say. because it it features into models. Risk free rates do. Oh. I wonder, from your perspective, when you set that oh. price target, how much of this? It's a mix between earnings growth, absolute, how much the money the S and P is yep. going to make, and then the multiple that you attach to it. So, how much is earnings growth per oh. se, and then how much is the multiple expansion aspect? Yeah. Well, the, the multiple expansion certainly does play a role in here. We're looking for around 21.7 times forward based on our, our earnings projection and our target. But consider the fact that the market is really, you know, it's many different types of players from all different parts of the world. But essentially, it's divided between traders and intermediate to longer term investors. The intermediate to longer term investors in the near term here, any weakness that they see are likely, if not buying the dips, which we wouldn't suggest, buy the babies that get thrown out with the bathwater, <laughs> the good stuff that gets knocked down. Uh, because, and their, their goals and objectives are very different. Yes. They're about preparing for a retirement, funding a retirement to not reduce one's... Uh, I mean, for long-term investors, technically, every dip in the market is a buy. And the bigger the dip, the bigger the buy. Like, literally, if you have a 20, 30, 40 year horizon, every dip in the market is a buy. If you're a long term investor, you should be buying several times a month. Every month. Every month. I buy every single week, right? Yeah. Standard of living, if one lives longer than one would expect, kids' education, all this serious stuff. Uh, and it's not that the short-term stuff isn't serious. It most certainly is. It keeps liquidity in the market. But we think that it's opportunity for a further widening, broadening of this rally. Uh, when I last looked, the, I think the Russell's up from October 17th. It's up, I think it's up 20, it's up 20, uh, 25 percent. The smalls are up 24 Wait, John, and they were in the toilet before. Yeah, no, and so... I, it sounds like you're making the argument that this is liquidity driven, because when I hear 21.7 <coughs> times when, when yep. rates are 400 basis yep. points higher than they were pre-COVID when we were trading yep. at 18, yep. um, it's hard for me to reconcile this in a world where, and I, look, um, I, I get where we are with the leadership of the market. I think it's very difficult to argue with that, but it's also very difficult for me to, 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 to reconcile where we are on a forward multiple of almost 22 times. Um, you're good with that. Yeah, I, 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 I feel this, I mean, you know, this, this the price target on Wall Street right now is the exact same it was two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago, the Christmas week of 2021, Wall Street's projections for earnings were 230. And here we are projecting for 24, it's 230. And the price target was around 49, and here we are looking at 5,000. Um, I think it, part of the convention of Wall Street is to predict something that's arbitrary. The real value add is like saying what you're saying is cyclicals versus defensive. Yeah. Because that's where alphas generate. It's not throwing darts yep. at a 12-month price target, right? And, 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 and in essence, what, what, we, what we see here is you're, you're in an environment where we're about right about where we should be in terms of uncertainty, the fact that, in, that the yield on the 10-year pulled way back, you know, from off from five or we were 389 or something like today, something like that, uh, last I looked. My point is, I think that interest rates could probably go, you, you can see the 10-year market price, it's the 
the yield is at four, four and a quarter. And I think that's livable. This is it's the end of free money. It's a good thing. It means bond issuers pay for the privilege of borrowing money. Bond buyers get something in return. <laughs> Diversification is back as a, a as a as a methodology for building portfolios. And this is a, not an easy spot to get through, but it would look to me to be highly navigable. Now, John. We could go on forever. We yeah, got to go, could. but... And you know I could. I know. I know you could. <laughs> One or two words. Your favorite sector for 2024. Ooh. Favorite sector. It, it has to be split between tech and consumer discretionary. Interesting. Okay, okay. Tech and consumer discretionary. Okay, next one up here. Amazon is positioned really well for 2024. So we'll react to these Amazon guys here. And then the last one is Ed Yardini, speaking about the markets in the economy. Stocks and their impact on online advertising into 2024. Our next guest Yard- is forecasting 11% Yardini. growth in the online ad industry, naming Pinterest a top pick, along with Meta and Alphabet, just raising his price target for each of those names. Joining us now is Colin Sebastian, Senior Research Analyst at Baird. What kind of signals are you getting, Colin, that that lead you to the optimistic growth forecast on online ads? Yeah, thanks and good morning. So, I mean, really it boils down to the state of the internet uh, sector is is quite positive. Uh, We're seeing revenue growth accelerate in many cases, margins are expanding, and, and there's line of sight to a lot of product innovation. And, and along with the fact that valuations, in, in, at least in historical context, are not really stretched. So, so that's what keeps us excited about, about those names you mentioned and, and others across e-commerce and social media. It looks like you have a buy on nearly all the stocks that you cover, everything from Alibaba to eBay, hey, Meta, Pinterest, Shopify, except for maybe Airbnb. Is, is it just a rising tide lifts all boats when it comes to online ads? Yeah, that, that's certainly part of it. Um, the the reality is we are seeing this year and into 2024 really a resurgence of secular growth trends across digital media, online advertising, e-commerce. Uh, we certainly have a preference for the larger platforms. And, you know, in a year where there are a lot of macro uncertainties, as, as you've just been discussing, we do have a preference uh, for the higher quality companies. So those like Meta, like Amazon, like Alphabet. But, but there is room for companies like Shopify and Pinterest that in themselves, you know, are emerging as higher quality technology and, and I like consumer Shopify. internet companies. Yeah. Where does AI, Colin, factor into all of this? I do not. I really want to repeat. I do not like Pinterest. I do not like Pinterest. I do not like Snapchat. I do not like companies like that. Um, I didn't like uh, Twitter when that was a public company. I felt like all those type of companies are just too niche. And in the advertising market... You know, when you're you're competing kind of against the metas of the world, I think, you know, you want to have scale. I think it'd be great if many of those companies had partnered up and all became one big uh, conglomerate, kind of like meta is with WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Instagram, right? But um, unfortunately, split apart, I feel like they show weakness. Particularly around Amazon. I I ask you because one of your peers on the street today over at Raymond James makes Amazon their top pick. Um, They're looking from laggard to leader in terms of AI. It seems like so many other companies are the ones dominating the conversa- conversation here, but what about Amazon? Well, for Amazon, I mean, on a broad level, you have that same context. You have faster growth, expanding margins, market share gains in online retail and, and recovery in cloud. In terms of AI specifically, Amazon's strengths are fully in the infrastructure layer and where they lack some momentum is on the application layer. That's where Microsoft and, and OpenAI True. have shown a lot of progress. So for the year True. ahead with Amazon in AI, they, they need to show more more momentum in the application layer, things they announced recently at reInvent. That being said, uh, you know we still think the stock is positioned really well for 2024. What does Meta have to do to back up the kind of year that they just had? Not suggesting in any way they're going to you know do 200% return, on the stock, but to have any sort of outperformance, what has to happen? Well, first off, on historical levels, the stock trades below uh, its its typical earnings multiples. Yep. So, you know, I think yep. I think compounding earnings growth will be enough for Meta. Aside from that, there's still yep. a lot of concern around competition 
from TikTok, for example. And, and there we're seeing reels continue to take market share. Stories is still driving a lot of monetization on Meta. The part that may be less well understood is the fact that messaging, WhatsApp and Messenger, these are emerging as new billion dollar businesses for Meta. We think that's gonna be a major theme in the year ahead and one reason why we like that stock. Yes, 100%. They always miss, they always miss WhatsApp. And it's like, does anybody understand how many people use WhatsApp? And that that's almost an untapped um, monetization opportunity that you know Meta's just going to start tapping into over this next few years. Woo-hoo-hoo. Okay, uh, you know, once again, Meta just has the, the beautiful thing about Meta and Amazon. Let me explain this to everybody, so everybody understands why that's the number one, number three biggest positions in the public count. Okay, listen, those two companies have so many growth levers all over the company to pull from. I love business models like that. That's why the, the, it's the number one and number three biggest position because those companies all over the place, they have growth levers. Like Meta has so many monetization opportunities that are so untapped. It's, it's incredible. It's like, you know, your house being under, I don't know, a, a gold mine or something like that. And it's like, you can just go under and there's just a bunch of gold under there. You can, you can uh, you know, dig out or whatever, whenever you want. Right. And that's how I feel with Meta. Same exact thing with, with Amazon. Like when you think about how many untapped opportunities there are for, for Amazon to grow over the next decade, it's, it's unbelievable. And so that's why I feel very comfortable in those sorts of stocks. And that's why they're both, a, you know, top three positions in the public count. Uh, let's get more into Amazon here. Releasing a new note with the 2024 Outlook for Internet and E-Commerce names. Joining us now is the analyst behind that note, Moffitt Nathanson's Michael Morton. Michael, happy holidays. Great to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, so Michael, hard not to, to notice here that your picks are very closely tied to consumer spending. Making these your top picks, is that also just a proxy for your confidence that the consumer will continue to spend in the new year? Yes, more specifically, it's a reflection of where we think the consumer is going to spend. Uh, I would say Shopify is an exception to the rules. There's always exceptions to rules like this. But the consumer in 2023 will likely look similarly in 2024. And that will be a a preference towards experiences, uh, which are measured as services, and non-discretionary goods. If you look at our covered companies that sell things you you don't need, they've really struggled to grow uh, post-COVID as there was a huge pull forward. Amazon has a great exposure to non-discretionary. They get it to you faster than anyone, and we believe there's a lot of upside to profitability in their retail business as you see leverage through their logistics. Okay, so let me disagree. I disagree with this gentleman, okay? I definitely disagree with him. I believe the consumer in, in 24 is going to be very different than the consumer you saw in 22 and 23. Whereas, you know, 2020, 2021, obviously goods, 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 right? World closed down, uh, no travel, none of that stuff. And so it was all like good spending, good spending, right? 2022, 2023, very heavy on services. Everybody, the world opens back up. People want to go on trips. They want to go here. They want to do this. They want to go to concerts, all this stuff, right? Taylor Swift, Beyonce, oh my gosh. I think 24, we're going to get back to a much more even economy, and so I think the, the spending is not going to necessarily uh, sway hard to either side like you saw for the last really four years, to be quite frank. I think we're going to look at a consumer in 2024 that's very, um, let's call it even keel with their spending between goods and services. And I don't think one's going to necessarily outshine the other. And so ultimately, who benefits from that is going to be goods. It's going to be the goods sector. It's going to be the e-commerce players, right? It's going to be the, the Shopify's and Amazon's and those sorts of companies because if anything, they're going to take some market share away from services that have been the, the kind of uh, you know bright light over the past few years. But it even goes, you even got to look more on a global basis, right? So for instance, I'm wearing a wind hat, right? If I think about wind resorts, I think wind resorts is going to tear it up in, in 2024 it, from in the, the Chinese side, right? The Macau side, because China just really opened back up for real this year in 2023, right? And so 2024 is going to be a huge, I think, growth year for Macau overall. And I think that's going to benefit them in a huge way. If I look at the United States, then I feel a little bit different. I feel like it's going to be a little more, you know, uh, let's call it a little rotation more to goods. And it's going to be more of a balanced approach. So you even got to look at it more on a a kind of a, let's just call it a little bit of a worldwide basis. And Uber, as we all know, if you're trying to go out to dinner uh, with family and friends over the holiday, travel to the airport, it's a great way to play the consumer's interest in experiences over things they don't need. So is that thesis, is that the reason why you actually lowered your price targets on DoorDash and Etsy? 
Yes, um, DoorDash and Etsy both have slightly different issues. DoorDash uh, is, is a stock that we love and we initiated on it in January. It's the, the profitability thesis has really played out. We are concerned about food delivery and its exposure to the same consumers that own student loans. If you look at the overlap of the app usage age to the overlap of where much of the student loans that restarted in October sit, it's pretty much a one for one ratio. Wow. And, uh, again, we think the delivery business is a great business that's been misunderstood for a long time, but the consumer is going to see this bill show up. Uh, at the end of the month with student loans kicked in in October, and we think that food delivery could be one budgetary area they might cut their spending. Really quickly, since you mentioned Amazon as a buy, what do you think of today's news that they're going to start showing ads on Amazon Prime Video unless you want to pay an extra $3 a month to get an ad? Food delivery, you know, it's funny. Um, something that's made me a little less bullish on, on food delivery is it's amazing how many times I'll go on Uber Eats or DoorDash and then won't end up ordering something because, man, you really get hammered. One, almost every restaurant in place charges more on Uber Eats or DoorDash than they do like if you actually just ordered from those companies. So you're already paying more for the product and sometimes it can be several dollars more per item, right? Then you get hit with a million different fees that they charge you. My gosh, it's this fee and that fee and this fee and that fee, right? Then you got obviously your taxes. Then on top of that, you got a tip. Right. And um, and, you know, I, I don't live that close, you know, because the way they built Vegas, they, you know, the, the suburbs and the nice communities are like way out there. And so to get something delivered in my house, it's like a quite a far drive. So I feel like I have to tip minimum like, you know, six bucks to ten dollars every time. So when I tack it on, I'm like this order is costing me 20 to 30 dollars more than if I just went and picked it up. Or my wife went and picked it up or saying things like that. Right. And so. I don't know, man. I, I, I Maybe I'm the only person that feels like that, but sometimes I'm just like, sometimes I'm like, I don't know if it's really worth it. So, you know, I don't know. I think if you maybe are live in a big city where everything's really close together, like a New York City, a San Francisco, maybe it's a little bit different if you live in downtown LA or something like that, right? Version. How, how big of a deal is this for investors and for the company's financials? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things to interpret through this news. First, it shows a cultural shift that has occurred in Amazon over the last 12 months. Again, as part of our thesis that there's a long run of profitability beats coming in the future, but that it's no longer just a free for all subsidizing everything under the sun. Uh, the, the second point is we love the strategy that they've taken. Uh, you've seen other companies that are starting to layer ads in where you basically you need to opt in and say, hey, I want to see ads. Amazon, in very clever fashion and op, uh, in the way they like to operate, you need to opt out. So by default, you're going to start seeing these advertisements and it will help subsidize the billions and billions of dollars that they spend on content every year. So it's just another check of the box uh, reflecting this business's uh, forward-looking emphasis on profitability growth. Yeah, yeah okay. Amazon such, let me just let him finish and then I'll speak on that. Yeah, for Amazon, um, you know, I don't mind paying for Prime, but there's something about having to pay that extra three bucks to not have ads. Uh, Michael Morton from Moffat Nathanson, thank you for your picks. Uh, appreciate you. Have a great day. So the thing that is so sneaky with Amazon, no one talks about, right? Everybody, you know, obviously the e-commerce business gets attention. AWS gets the most attention. But the sneakiest thing with Amazon's business model, and one of the other reasons I love Amazon stock, is because of the advertising business. No one really talks about it. It's it's grown into a giant, and it just keeps growing and growing. And now it's the really the third. In my opinion, it's kind of the third pillar of their overall company. Alrighty, next one up here. The last one, Ed Yardini on his feelings on the economy, market, all those sorts of things. Five hundred now. Yardini, longest week. Ed Yardini, nearly twenty years. Joining us now, and where we go ahead is Ed Yardini, one of the biggest bulls on the street, and of course the president of Yardini Research. Ed, it's great to have you on CNBC and closing bell again. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming on. You've sure. got a 5,400 price target on the S&P by the end of next year. Why the optimism? Well, 5,400 by the end of next year and then 6,000 by the end of uh, 2025. I think this is a bull market that uh, has legs that's going to continue to charge ahead. Uh, the optimism is uh, fundamentally based on the notion that uh, we had a recession uh, this uh, past year, but it's been a rolling recession. The rolling recession actually started in 2022. Uh, and now as we look ahead here, uh, we're looking at rolling recoveries in a lot of sectors that went into. Oh, let's be very clear. Uh, Yardeni is, is honestly 
maybe the most bullish person out there at 5,400 expecting year-end price target for, for the market. And 6,000, 2025, I would love that. I'm not as bullish uh, on the market the next uh, couple years as Yardeni is, but man, if that happens, I'll be a happy, happy camper as somebody that's obviously extremely net long the market all the time, right? A recession, but the overall economy has proven to be remarkably resilient, particularly the consumer. And I think that's likely to continue to happen. I think what we're seeing here is a, a significant relief rally. And the relief is that we're not going to have an economy wide recession. And the relief is that inflation, in fact, can come down without a recession. Yeah, you just heard our segment with Sharon on yep. on the on the consumer and retail. Yep. One point one trillion in credit card debt doesn't seem to matter, or maybe that we have the one point one trillion because people continue to spend. Are you are you shocked mm -hmm. still at the level of just confidence the consumer is showing? Well, they're showing it by spending, obviously. In all due respect, sir, uh, credit card debt has been on an upward trend for the last uh, <laughs> three four decades. Uh, it's should be a bigger number next year. Should be the bigger number the following year. Should be a bigger number the following year. If you ever see that number fall in any substantial way, it's ultimately because you probably just went through a huge recession. So if we're healthy every year, credit card debt should go up. Um, you yeah. know, if you, if you ask people, uh, they, they actually tell you that things are pretty lousy. But uh, apparently, uh, you, know, you know, I've always had this view of Americans that when we're happy, we spend money. When we're depressed, we spend more. Uh, but <laughs> there's money out there. People are working. Uh, real incomes are, are going up. Wages are rising faster than prices. And I know there's a sort of alarm about all the consumer debt, but virtually all of that is, is, is paid off uh, on a regular monthly basis. I mean, it's 22 uh, percent is, is the charge of some of these things. So I think most Americans pay, pay the, just use this for convenience sake. And consumer credit, uh, outstanding, really never has had a good a track record of predicting when the consumers would, would retrench. It's jobs. And if the job market suddenly uh, collapses, then we'll have a recession. But right now, there's plenty of job openings. Can stocks... Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, whew. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made, absolutely. I've been waiting three weeks, three weeks to get a bid on my front yard, uh, the, the quote back. Because supposedly they're so busy down there, they can't even flip and flapjack and get me my quote. Three weeks. Three weeks. I mean, my gosh, like, come on, dudes. But, I mean, these landscape companies have so much work because so many homes are being built here in Vegas all the time, and they just have so many customers that need front yards done, backyards done, that they're just in total control, and they can charge whatever they want to charge, and they get you the quote whenever they want to get you the quote. Because we listen, we know this. At least I believe this, and tell me if you if you believe it as well. Ed. Sure. The stock market may represent the economy in some way, but stock market is not the economy. Economies can go down or stall, and stocks can go up, and vice versa. If we see the economy mm -hmm. slow down a bit, can earnings well, look, still can, grow? Can multiples yeah. still grow? Can stocks still yeah. grow? Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, the stock market is a discounting mechanism. It looks ahead, basically over the next 12 months and uh, tries to determine whether the economy is going to grow, whether earnings are going to grow, or whether we're going to have a recession. I think the market's done a pretty good job of concluding that uh, after last year's uh, bear market, uh, that uh, that was not justified by the economy. The economy looks pretty good. I think ever since October of last year and again in October of this year, uh, the, the stock market's been discounting what I call an immaculate disinflation, the idea that you're going to have inflation come down without a recession. What, what people forget about is that there is a recession out there. It's, it happens to be in China, and China is uh, exporting a lot of deflation, and so they're doing us a great favor. Their economy is in trouble, and as a result, we're getting some real relief on inflation, particularly for goods. Good, well put, and we've been in kind of a rolling recession last uh you know, really like two years to be quite frank, all right? All right, guys, appreciate you joining me for this beast of a video. It might be the most beast video I've ever done uh, on this reaction channel. Holy smokers, that was no joke. So I hope you enjoyed that. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not already new all-time high subscribers. Also, pin comment down there. Get access to that video I filmed for you guys last weekend. 45-minute kind of beast video that goes into exactly how I plan to invest in 2024 with all this debate about what's going to happen in the markets and the economy and soft landing, hard landing, Fed lowering rates, raising rates. How am I actually investing? That video goes all into depth into that. That's pin comment down there. Much love and have a great day.